just for excess ID capacity, uh, that is the bench cost. I may not agree with that because uh, you know, being entrepreneur uh, in nature, you have to take that expenses within your uh, you know computation because that's a part of the risk that you are taking. And I wouldn't say that's really an abnormal cost. But under utilization of capacity, yes, it could basically uh, be a proposition because at the end of the day, uh, you have to look at the profit because under utilization of capacity is really got nothing to do with the international transaction to that extent. So I would say that yes, you have to. So what would I do? I would try to really find comparable companies which are the, in the initial stages of setup in terms of the fact that uh, you know the companies you have from the database find out really when the company is incorporated or an existing company having a new uh, expansion activity or a new unit that is set up. Maybe I'll try to compare that uh, to that extent and uh, that's something which uh, is uh, probably would, would hopefully throw up a, a better uh, analysis. Uh, again, uh, practically I would go for uh, comparing myself or making the adjustment for the taxpayer and uh, to that extent I'll try and put a, a comparable analysis. In the alternative, I can assume that my capacity was utilized to the fullest and to that extent what my profitability would have been. I mean, there is a, there, that's the only way I can do it because uh, I would feel that comparable companies you cannot make any adjustment to that extent. So both qualitative and again you will have to give a lot of qualitative reason as to why uh, you are actually making a loss uh, or whatever that situation is and uh, in that sense build up your documentation based on both uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis. international transaction entered into with an associated enterprise is computed in relation to cost incurred or sales affected or asset employed or to be employed by the enterprises or having regard to any other relevant base. Now this is basically the uh, sort of position given in the law as to how I need to compute the profit margin of the tested party or the SSE. Whereas one thing is very clear that the margin has to be computed. It is very clear that margin realized by the enterprises from the international transaction is very clear. Now in a very typical sense of accounting, how do I arrive at a margin? If I have taken an international transaction, to arrive at the margin of the international transaction, there has to be two aspects available to me. Aspect number one is the receipt or the revenue, and aspect number two is the cost associated with it. So when I subtract the cost from the receipts, I arrive at the margin. Now this is the general thing. Meaning thereby, there is a presumption in the law that in respect of the international transaction, when I am arriving at, when I am trying to arrive at the profit margin, if it is a sales transaction, I do have available the relevant costs. And if I have the international transaction as costs, then I have a relevant sales figure. Again, coming to the fact that the second line, it says that the net profit margin realized by the enterprises from an international transaction is to be computed in relation to the cost, sales, assets employed. Meaning thereby, I do not have any choice in selection of the numerator. I can choose the appropriate base. I can choose the denominator as cost, sales, assets employed, or any other appropriate base. But I have no choice to select what is my net margin. Net margin in the law, in the Income Tax Act, is not defined. Therefore, 
A common meaning of net margin has to be taken. Various courts have held that. Now, when I take the common, mar common meaning of the net margin, it goes beyond me to think about any adjustment for underutilization of capacity or the like. Because margin of the enterprise, I have to take as it is. I can choose the bits. I can choose the denominator while computing the percentage. This is one side of it. Secondly, as Mr. Patakrika said, in rule 10B1E3, if there is any adjustment is required to be made, that adjustment can only be made in the hands of the comparators and not in the hands of the test department. So I have two choices available to me to implement this law. Number one, that I choose the comparable who are in the similar phase of their business in the public domain. In those who are also in the starting phase, they are also entering into the market, they are also struggling in a similar fashion and things like that. This is one way of I choosing the comparables. If that is not possible, possibly I can choose certain age. Age of the comparable. A company who is well established will not be comparable to a company who is just a starting of this business. Third thing that I want to say, when you go to rule 10b2, 10b2 gives you four factors of comparabilities. Like any comparable that I choose, how they are to be compared with my tested party, these are four factors given in rule 10b2. Unfortunately, business penetration, business strategy is not one of the factors provided in the Indian law. In the OECD guidelines, this factor of business strategy is there. Possibly at the international level, this factor is recognized, but Indian law does not recognize that. And I must tell you, it is not an omission. So therefore, going by this fact, underutilization of capacity possibly cannot be adjusted for. Computation of any profit by taking that portion out from the PNL account would not be appropriate, would not be there. My choice would be to take the profit of the tested party or the company as it is and look for the comparables which are closest to the tested. <coughs> Sometimes life puts you in the minority, but that's okay. That's the way you're supposed to. That's the way you're supposed to debate. This is my proposition. And, uh, sir, I would just like to have a debate. That's all in one. That's it. It's like this. Uh, from where does the rule come? The rule that is set out as per law is for the proper efficacy of the functioning of the main legislation. So the rule is subservient to the law. It is there for the purposes of the law itself, that is the legislation. And what does the legislation want? I don't know. I read it a hundred times. Every day I read it ten times probably. I like to read 90 to 1 again and again because every time I read it, I believe God gives me another viewpoint of life. I don't know, I may be wrong. See, it's like this. Any income, any income arising from an international transaction, so the words are income arising from an international transaction, shall be computed having regard to arm's length price. So I think the proposition that we are looking for is income arising from an international transaction to be computed at arm's length price. So if you have to determine the arm's length price for the purposes of determining the income from the international transaction, so ultimately the arm's length price affects my income of only the international transaction. Now this proposition has been accepted as the norm 
that you can only make adjustment to the international transaction and not to the whole entity. At least that much is clear. There are about 50 case clause on that. Correct? Uh, Ron? Sir, that the adjustment is only to the international transaction is... Is well documented? I'm sure I'll be allowed to speak. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Fine. No problem. Okay, so now this is the proposition. To derive the income from the international transaction, five methods are given. So if you see how the methods have been stated in the rules, so for example, when you apply the comp method, or when you apply the cost plus method, or whether you apply the resale price method, or you apply the transactional net margin method. Profit split, I'm just parking on the side because its philosophy, its methodology is very different. So if you want to read any of the rules which prescribe the method, so either they will talk of, if it is a transaction-based method, the price of the international transaction. So for just for the sake of this year, that I feel most comfortable when I read the law only. I like to read interpretation later. I only like to read the law because I believe the law is to be seen, read, and understood and interpreted as it is stated. I think that is one of the first uh, principles of interpretation of statute. So what does it say? That when you apply the comparable uncontrolled price method, the price charged or paid for property transfer. It's exact. Why? Because cup is exact. So it doesn't talk of enterprise, it doesn't talk of anything. It talks of the price for the property, uh, price charged or paid for the property transfer. When you see the cost plus method, they say direct and indirect cost of production incurred by the enterprise in respect of the property transfer. Similarly, if you read resale price, it will talk of the price at which the property purchased or services obtained by the enterprise from an E is resold or are provided to an unrelated enterprise. So it is specific to that property or service. And rule 10b 1e1 says the net profit realized by the enterprise from an international transaction. What is the meaning of net profit realized by an enterprise from an international transaction is up for debate and I am aware of it. The proposition is that you cannot make any adjustments to the tested party. But I am not even talking of adjustments. I am saying derive the profit of the international transaction. How do you interpret that? So in Transwich, in the Delhi Tribunal judgment, it stated that abnormal costs have to be taken out. So under utilization of cost are non-recurring costs. Underutilization of people is non-recurring. If you can demonstrate, you beefed up because that was your business model. There are some entrepreneurs who may not beef up. There are some entrepreneurs who may ramp up and then go to the marketplace. Tax or transfer pricing does not tell a businessman how to do business. He has to only demonstrate that the transaction is at arm's length. Transfer pricing doesn't tell you that you have to do business in a particular manner so that your transaction is at arm's length. Your business model has to be such that it is impartial, it is fair, and it is reasonable. So Transmit says that non-recurring costs are to be omitted. And similarly, if you were to read Petro Adel Adelgaard, or you were to read MDOCS, or you were to read Global Turbine, that proposition is there. I know there is a debate because most most of the time, it is believed that Rule 10b E sub clause 3 talks of economic adjustments to comparables. That is correct. But this economic adjustments which are to be done is when there are economic functions not performed by me or performed by me and not performed by the comparables for which adjustments are to be done. The proposition is what is the meaning to be ascribed to the words net profit of any international transaction? I think that's the key. I have given my proposition. Uh, the panelists, the wise panelists have given theirs. Now it is a debate which only jurisprudence will solve. But I have given the proposition. I, I would like them to just comment upon it. So then we can move to the next case study. Thanks. So uh, I agree uh, you know, with uh, what, what your uh, debate. 
petered out. Uh, so I, I will just again summarize what I, I would believe would be right. Um, uh, I would still try to adhere to the law in a sense that uh, I would compute my net profit and or rather uh, no, again, let me just give it. Uh, no, uh, not only on the lighter side. I also try and adhere to the law only. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, just on the lighter. Yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. So, the the point sometimes is that, as I said, practical aspect is very important. Now, there is a case law uh, of uh, Mumbai uh, Tribunal where they have actually dismissed uh, the case of the taxpayer, saying that TNM requires you to look at net profit and you have looked at operating profit. And because you have looked at operating profit, you have not adhered to the law. Now that's where the practical aspect comes into picture because the difference between operating profit and net profit, where very clearly, I mean, why, do you, why do you exclude interest? Why do you exclude tax? Because that is not really related to the way uh, you know, a, a company operates. It's more of your, uh, you know, the, if you, suppose for example, if you have a tax holiday, you cannot be really worse off or be better off because of that. Or interest, that's your uh, way of uh, did, you know going and funding your business, whether it's equity or whether you want debt. So there has to be a practical approach. And, and the, to, the, to that mind, I would say that I would my first approach would be to see whether I can compute the profit of the company the way it is and look at comparable companies and compare, as I mentioned, look at initial startup companies or to that extent, you know, whatever that is possible. If that is not possible, I would still go back and and find a practical way to say that, okay, how do I really compute the net profit in the right way? And that's where I would go and agree with what uh, Vispi is saying and make an adjustment uh, to that to the extent possible. And that's what uh, generally we've been doing. Now, of course, revenue would have a different perspective on that, but we need to move forward in terms of really what you want to achieve because in the, in the context of looking at what the law is, we are basically you know, not trying to see the larger objective of transfer pricing. The transfer pricing is not to really come to one price and come to exact comparability. That's really not the case. The whole idea of looking at arithmetical mean to my mind is really something that you know, one needs to look at because you are telling the uh, taxpayer to transact at a particular price. Whereas if you see overseas, you, it's a range that is given. And that's how it happens, right? In a third party situation, you will negotiate the price. So, I would feel that practical aspects, law, practical aspects needs to be there. Of course, one can challenge because if you're not adhering to the law in, in strict way, that can be challenged. But that's the way you need to have an approach which will enable you to come to a fair transfer price than an exact transfer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I again go back to my proposition and say that, for me, these two books are Bible. I can't go beyond them. This is one. Adherence to them is my job. Any level of explanation, which may be, however, forceful, if it actually goes beyond law, I would have my reservations against that. There have been decisions, and I do not say that those decisions are not as per law or as per law. Those decisions are going to be further refined, I'm sure. But for the present, what is very important is to understand. What do you need to understand is the law. Try and implement that law in toto as it is only in case of invisibility that possibly some level of approximations that you might restore to. Because you would grant me to say one thing, when I started off in transfer pricing maybe about seven, eight years before, the capital line and progress database did have about 5,000, 6,000 companies in them. Today they are having about 30,000 companies. Our database is getting more refined, more details are available in public domain. We are growing and moving towards the horizon where more disclosures are being made by the companies, more things are available for us. The law which is there is basically, of course, I am sure there, is, there are uh, issues in implementation. 
issues in complete adherence and those issues would be there when you definitely apply to it. But I must say that in India, the way transfer pricing is practiced is basically in a, is like any other assessment, which possibly is not done anywhere in the world. Why? Because anywhere else in the world, the transfer pricing exercise or the audit is considered to be very, very resource intensive. Huge level of documentation are required. A lot of time is devoted into the analysis. This is where we fail. Because I think our system is such, and maybe Mr. Bhatta Peter or Mr. Patel will build me out, that there, there would be a taxpayer reaching to them on 25th of October or maybe 25th of November to say that I need to file my 3 C B by 30th November and they, they would do that uh, with the constraint that they have. I, it doesn't take away anything from them. They are doing their profession without respect. I, I appreciate that. But within those five days with the resource constraint, with the problems that is available in the database and things like that, what you did is correct as per law would be audacity to say. I think one should be open to the fact that law as it stands today in the books is what is we need to reach at with our best of efforts. Not making an effort and saying that this is what is correct, possibly we are shirking our responsibility. This is what, in short, I would want to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ron. I think there are practical difficulties. And the difficulty is that when you really in real life have where manufacturing capacities are not used, there is IT time, there is IT cost, how do you account for it? Does it form part of your normal operating cost? Does not form part of your normal operating cost? These are issues which will, all, which will evolve with time and with jurisprudence. And uh, with that, the organizers tell me that there will be a five minute tea break. 10 minutes tea break, okay? So that you can be more refreshed for the next two case studies. Thanks.